folks, the last video for this chapter five, I swear. And uh, hopefully this will be short and sweet. Um, so in that last video, so if you're keeping track of learning goals and how well you're doing, um, so I want you to be able to understand the difference between an ideal solution and an ideal dilute solution. So be familiar with exothermic and endothermic solution formation. And really, in other words, like the difference between delta H for an ideal solution and a non-ideal solution. Um, and then be familiar with colligative properties of boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. Um, and you know that, that also includes vapor pressure lowering um, due to added solutes. And so in this last diagram, or in this last video, we'll go we'll cover these three. Know how to read and interpret binary vapor pressure diagrams, know how to read and interpret temperature composition diagrams, and be familiar with azeotropes, okay? So let's do it. So suppose now I have a solution. I'm gonna draw another beaker here. You would think by now I've gotten good at drawing beakers, but I haven't or that I would have drawn myself a beaker using PowerPoint. In any event, we've got liquid of A and liquid of B. We're mixing them together, right? And we note that they are in um, equilibrium with their vapors, each respectively in equilibrium with their vapors, okay? And let's also suppose that A is more uh, volatile. And so what that means, it doesn't mean that it's more reactive. It means that the vapor pressure of pure A is greater than the vapor pressure of pure B, which you can actually see on this diagram right here. Okay, so if you notice, we've got another mole fraction diagram going on. Mole fraction of A at zero, mole fraction of A at one. So when the mole fraction of A um, is one, that means the solution is pure A. And you can see here, right, the vapor pressure, pure A is greater than pure B, okay? So now we have this other concept here. We've got uh, an X or a chi, a Y, and a Z, okay? So in these diagrams, Z is the generic mole fraction, okay? Chi or X is specific um, for the liquid. So it's the mole fraction of the liquid. And Y is the mole fraction of the vapor. So on this axis, it's just an axis from zero to one. So that's why it's given Z. Z is just generic for mole fraction. But we also notice that we have here the mole fraction of A in the liquid, and we have the mole fraction of A in the vapor, okay? So here is how, so in other words, YA is really going to be um, the vapor pressure of pure A divided by the total pressure at any point along this line, the total pressure of the solution, and of course, YB is the vapor pressure of pure B divided by the total vapor pressure, okay? So now the way this works, so suppose I make a solution of mole fraction A. So suppose I make um, a solution of A and B with a mole fraction, whatever it is, right, at chi A, indicated by this point right here, all right? So these binary vapor uh, diagrams, all right, the top line is always the liquid and the bottom line is always the vapor. So in other words, this blue line is the determination of YA, okay, um, and the, um, the, Red line is the determination of chi A. And we note that if both of these had the same vapor pressure, if P vape A was exactly the same as the vapor pressure of B, there would be no difference. However, because A is more volatile than B, it has an enriched concentration in the vapor. So in other words, 
if this is now my liquid mixture, where I've actually mixed these together, and that's the composition that I want, the concentration of A in the vapor, I have to travel straight across this constant pressure line, okay? And now that gives me my concentration of A in the vapor. And it will always be true that the more volatile component, in other words, the component that has the larger vapor pressure will have a larger concentration in the vapor. Hopefully that makes sense, okay? And so what we would see here, so I'm gonna write down an equation. I'm not gonna hold you um, responsible for this derivation or anything like that, but the equation, those, you know, this line, this blue line right here, um, is the following, so it goes chi A, so the mole fraction in the liquid, times the pure vapor pressure of A, um, divided by the pure vapor pressure of B, plus the difference between the vapor pressure of A minus the vapor pressure of B, times chi A. And then, of course, we could say YB simply just equals 1 minus YA, right? Okay? So now, what, we're, what we've got going on here, this is an illustration of the, um, of the ratio of these vapor pressures, okay? So, for example, this line right here that says number 1, um, so this is actually PA divided by P. B equals 1. And so, again, as you can see, there would be no difference between the um, vapor lines or the liquid lines, okay? But now look, if that ratio is 2, so if A is twice as volatile, now you start giving this curvature, and I'm going to put a different color line here to indicate what the liquid composition would be. Um, oops, let's see, I want a different color. So again, on this graph, okay, um, actually, yes, let's go back, black. So on this graph here, this is the vapor. So all of these lines are the vapors, okay? Um, and the liquid line is not drawn on here, but I can draw it because it's just a straight line connecting this point to that point, okay? So that would be the liquid composition if A were twice as volatile as B. And of course, if A were four times as volatile as B, it's gonna look something like that. And so as you can see what you get here, okay, what I'm gonna to refer to as a tie line, right, the lines that may be at one pressure connect it to this pressure, um, that's called a tie line. And so let me draw that a little bit better here. Yes, so I've got a nice zoom in. So suppose I were to zoom in. We're now, here is my liquid line. Okay. And here is my vapor line. Oops, let me draw that better. So I'm kind of exaggerating this. You know, I'm not showing these connected or anything like that. Um, and, so, and so let's see here, vapor for this line, okay? So there exists some point that's halfway between these points, and that makes what we call a tie line, okay? All right? And what that tie line gives us here is if I go all the way down to where my mole fraction scale is, right? So this would be like, you know, I'm just gonna say generic mole fraction, ZA, Okay, we recognize that this line right here would be the mole fraction of A in the vapor, and this line right here would be the mole fraction of A in the liquid. And so what is that tie line? Okay, so this is now what we call the lever rule. And so I'm going to put a couple things down here, all right? So I'm going to write... NL, meaning the number of moles in the liquid is on this side, and the number of moles of gas is on that side, okay? And we can actually then determine 
if let's suppose we had this composition, you know, where here is my liquid composition, here is my vapor composition, using this lever rule, I can actually calculate how many moles are in the gas and how many moles are in the liquid by the following. We recognize the total number of moles is just going to be the number of moles of liquid plus the number of moles of gas. So that's the total number of moles I put in the solution in the first place. Okay. And so now I can say in total times ZA, so this point that's halfway between, equals NL times chi A plus NG times Y A. Okay? And so what I can do then is some algebra. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to show all of this algebra, but basically it works out to be a proportion where now the length of this line, so I'm going to say LL and LG, is directly proportional to the number of moles. So the lever rule just simply distills to NL times LL equals NG times LG. So it's basically a proportionality. So if I scan across this graph, right, if I, if I find a point that's halfway between, um, you know, my vapor, my liquid line and my vapor line and do these subtractions and do this proportion, um, assuming that I knew what the total number of moles was, which I would have had to because I made the solution, um, then I could actually calculate exactly how many moles of this thing are in the gas and how many moles of this thing are in the liquid. So that's all I'm really going to say about that on these vapor pressure diagrams. So be able to interpret these diagrams. Understand the liquid line is going to make just a straight line from one vapor pressure to the other. And the vapor lines are going to be the one that's curved underneath. Okay. So um, let's see here. So kind of going through just one more example of this. All right. So suppose I start with a liquid at point A, okay? So that, so I make some liquid with that composition, all right? And I know then that the initial composition of this, of the liquid, will be at A1. However, A1 prime will give me its concentration in the vapor, okay? So now suppose I reduce the pressure from P1 to P2. So suppose I put this thing in some type of apparatus that actually allows me to pump on this liquid, okay? And so what I'm doing here is I'm building up the physics of fractional distillation. So this is describing the physical chemistry of distillation. In other words, making booze in some uh, applications. So now suppose I'm able to pump on that liquid. I pump it out into some other reservoir, okay? Well, look what's going to happen. So the pressure gets reduced to this tie line, okay? Which would allow me to then calculate how many moles are in the gas and how many moles are in the liquid. And then I would know, of course, that now the number of moles in the liquid is reduced here. So how is it that the number of moles in the liquid gets reduced? Well, that's because as I'm pumping out that vapor, more of the liquid has to now evaporate. And in this case, more of A is evaporating because A is more volatile, okay? And so what that means now is more of this A has to evaporate out of the liquid so the concentration of A in the liquid gets reduced. Correspondingly, of course, the concentration of A in the vapor is going to get reduced, but that makes sense because we pumped it out. Okay. And now if we keep doing this, if I keep reducing the pressure, what I will eventually be able to do, right, if I keep following down this line, I keep going on and on and on, I will eventually have pumped out all of my A and I will only be left with B, okay? 
So in other words, I can keep doing this. I can keep reducing the pressure and keep making more and more of these tie lines. A is always going to continue to be reduced because A is the more volatile component and A is getting swept out more than B is. B is still getting swept out, okay? But A is getting swept out more than is B. Eventually, this allows me now to completely separate A from B, which is the process of fractional distillation, okay? So I can also look at this in terms of a temperature composition diagram. And now keep track of these, okay? This one gets a little tough because in the pressure diagrams, the liquid is on the top and the vapor is on the bottom. In the temperature diagrams, it flips. So keep track of that. In the temperature versus mole fraction diagrams, now look, the vapor is on top and the temperature is on the bottom, okay? So suppose that I wanna go do this. So let's draw like my nice little still. So maybe here's my round bottom flask. Uh, here's my fractionating column. You know, with my uh, thermometer in there somewhere, maybe I'm using an electronic thermocouple right there, okay? Um, and then here is my side arm right there, right, that I know I'm adding. Um, cold water in to make condensation. And then now here on the other side, it drips out into my little collection flask. This is a pretty terrible looking still, okay, for distilling, let's say, some liquid. So how does this work on my temperature mole fraction diagram, okay? Well, suppose I start at A1. So start at A1, okay? And A1 is not boiling yet, so that's why it's down here. It's not quite on this line because what this line represents now, this blue line gives me my boiling temperature of the liquid at any one of these compositions. And as you can see, when the mole fraction of... Um, a is pure, you can see that there's a lowering of the boiling point by adding more stuff, so that makes sense, okay? And so now what I do, I've got my liquid in here, and I heat it up to the point where it starts boiling, okay? So now that takes us all the way up to this composition A2, okay? So now my mixture is boiling at A2. The mole fraction of A is still the same in the liquid, but look, the vapor will be more enriched in A. So as this is now condensing, as my liquid comes over and condenses, this will be the vapor composition of the condensate. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And so now what happens in this thing, when it goes into the sidearm where there's cooling water, right? It's gonna cool it down, okay? So follow this diagram, right? It goes up, it boils at A2. The vapor composition is A2 prime, so it's more enriched in A. And now as it cools down, when it enters this side flask here, it's gonna cool down to this composition A3 in my little still, right? In my flask, and we note here that now a, right, the mole fraction of A in the solution has increased. And if we were to keep doing this, so here what I've actually just described is a regular old still, but if we had a fractional distillation, so in other words, you put all these little like glass beads in here, okay, all those little glass beads are cold. So actually what happens, this process I described where it boils, um, and then A is more enriched, and then it cools again. This is actually going on in the fractionating column before it even comes over, okay? And so what happens then in this fractionating column, you're getting a lot of this boiling and cooling, and boiling and cooling, and boiling and cooling. And every time that happens on this diagram, you go up, you go over, and then you go down, and then, you now are boiling it again, 
And so now A is even more enriched. It cools down to this liquid composition and it just keeps going. And as you might imagine, you just keep going until you have pure A. So this is how you could actually separate something by boiling in this fractional distillation. Okay. Well, as it turns out, there's two particular types here, um, or excuse me, let me, let me back up for just a second. So in this um, diagram, this is showing us um, a totally ideal solution, one that would allow us to completely separate A from B. So in this fractionating column, so all these steps are going on here. And so now eventually when you have just pure A, when it makes it out of the top, there will only be A in that side, and of course there's A and B in this side, okay? Now, what happens if you have something that's non-ideal? Well, that makes what we call an azeotrope. And by definition, azeotropes are liquids that can't be separated by boiling. So in other words, there is some type of interaction between those two liquids that are keeping them in such a strong thermodynamic interaction that they're not going to boil and so the or they're not going to get separated and the reason for that is because actually they have this point on their temperature composition diagram where the vapor composition and the liquid composition is the same and once you get to that point, you can't get past it anymore. And so this is just an example of a high boiling azeotrope and a low, low boiling azeotrope. So um, water and ethanol is a good example of a high boiling azeotrope. You have to go to a really high boiling point to get them to separate. Okay. Um, or rather, I should, sorry, I should say their boiling point increases to get them to separate. Um, here, this would be more of a better example of like a non-volatile component or a component with a very low vapor pressure that's lowering the boiling temperature okay so but what's going to end up happening when you're doing this whole idea of like uh you know boiling and then separating the mixture and boiling and separating and boiling and separating it's going to hit this point now where the composition is identical of the vapor and the liquid and you can no longer separate it at that point Okay. So that's all that I really kind of want to say about azeotropes. Just recognize they're two liquids that can't be separated by boiling. And that's because they have this point on their temperature composition diagram um, where the vapor composition and the liquid composition is the same. And that prevents you from being able to separate these. Okay. So um, I think that's about it. Hopefully after this video, and a little bit of studying, you know how to read and interpret binary vapor pressure diagrams, as well as temperature composition diagrams, just being familiar with it, okay? And be familiar with azeotropes, all right? So um, that was a pretty qualitative chapter. We probably won't do much with this in terms of math, but there's some really good application of our thermodynamics at play here with simple mixtures. Okay, folks, I'll see you in the next video.